Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny Dollar, eh? That's right. Who are you? Uh, insurance investigator. Well, are you that Johnny Dollar? That's right. Freelance investigator. Oh, but now freelance. Who? I want the man who works for the Star Mutual Insurance Company, not any freelance. Well, I work for Star Mutual. You what? On occasion, at least. On occasion, eh? Well, if one of their clients has some trouble, you have to get on the job for him, don't you? Well, that depends. Who are you, depends. sir? Depends. What are you talking about? Do you work for him or don't you? On assignment, yes. Then get yourself an assignment, then get yourself over here right away. Over where? Here at my apartment. What's the matter with you? Are you an idiot? Where else could I possibly want you? Has it by any chance occurred to you, sir, that I might not have the least idea who you are? Well, what difference can that possibly... Oh, oh, oh yes, that, that, that's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, very well. My name is Timothy Jarrett. Now, get over here immediately. Do you mind if I check with Star Mutual first? Don't be wasting your time. Check with them after you get here. If I get there. Look, what Mr. Jarrett. What do you Jarrett, mean, if you do? You haven't even told me what your problem is. Do I have to go out and shout murder from the housetops? Murder? To get you to pay any attention to me? Did you say murder? Of course I did. Whose and when? Do you suppose I'd be talking to you if it had already occurred? Oh, I'm sure I haven't the least idea. Of course I wouldn't. How could I? But if you're not over here right away, I'll call that insurance company and have you fired. All right, you do that. I'll be waiting for you. You will. Hello. Hello. Well, it may be a nice long wait, Mr. Jared. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Lorelei matter. It was pretty obvious from that phone call that Mr. Timothy Jarrett was a crackpot of the first water. And I was all set to forget about him and go on about my business. But I had some errands to do in town, and one of them took me into the building where Star Mutual holds forth. So I made that my first stop and barged in on Ed Williams. Johnny! Well, how are you, boy? Glad to see you. Hi, Ed. What brings you here? Don't tell me you're having to go around digging up assignments these days. <laughs> Sit down. Thanks. Cigarette? I don't mind if I do. Here you are. Thank you. Yeah, I got a lighter. Right. Thanks. Mm hmm Well? Ed, I uh, believe you have a client by the name of Timothy Jared. Oh, yeah, Johnny. I'm afraid so. What's the matter? Why the groan? Well, I ought to be grateful for him, though, I guess. After all, that life policy of his has a face value of nearly two million bucks. Two million? Wow, I thought maybe he was just some old nut. Oh, he is, Johnny. No question about it. Just about as wacky as they come. Don't you know who and what he was? The famous all-or-nothing Gerard? Was or is? Oh, he's still alive, if that's what you mean. But, Johnny, about 40 years ago, Gerard was one of the cleverest stock manipulators ever hit the scene. No kidding. Made himself millions and millions. Mm. And in those days, you could keep what you made. Really loaded him? Well, he was. What do you mean by that? Oh, he still has enough to get along on. Plenty. But after the five or six beautiful dolls that he married and divorced, well, you know what they can do to a man and his money. Well, let's say I've heard. Thank goodness this present one seems to have a little sense. Oh, she's young and pretty enough, all right, but... Well, maybe you've heard of her. Name is Lorelei Lambert. She's an artist, and I understand a pretty good one. Came from Quebec originally. Oh? Spends a lot of time out of town, away from the old coot. But I'm sure it's just on account of her sketching and painting. I see. Matter of fact, the last time I talked to Mr. Gerard, that was uh, uh, day before yesterday, she was off on another of her field trips. But what about the old boy, Johnny? Well, I got a crazy phone call from him. Mm, sorry, I, I guess I was kind of responsible for it. You were? Another of his complexes working on him. And I promised if it proved to have any basis, I might call you in just to shut him up. But I certainly didn't expect him to call you. What do you mean by complexes? Nothing else to do, so he worries about himself. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, it was a persecution complex. Before that, he was certain he was going to be robbed. Uh, but he wasn't. Of course not. Before that, he was sure that his apartment, the whole block maybe, was going to burn down over his head. And so on for the past couple of years. Well, what did he tell you it was this time? 
Well, he mentioned the word murder. <laughs> I hope you laughed in his face. Who would ever gain anything by killing off that old character? You tell me. Who's the insurance beneficiary? Pretty little Lorelei, his wife. But he knows better than to think she'd ever raise a hand against him. He's given her everything, Johnny. Everything she can possibly need or want. Besides, she isn't a type. Is there a type for murder? Well, you tell me. If he was such a stock manipulator, how about some old enemies showing up? Maybe somebody he might have defrauded. After 40 years? Uh, I guess you got a point there. It's just another one of his complexes having something to do, something to worry about. Okay, Ed, I'll just forget about him. Oh, no, Johnny, Johnny, don't do that. Why, what do you mean? Got to keep him happy. Old Buzzard wouldn't hesitate to cancel out that policy in a minute. And I don't want to lose those nice big premiums. No, as long as he's asked for you, Johnny, you'd better go and see him. Hold his hand, promise him anything you like, and then you can forget him. But you go see him, Johnny. Here, I'll give you his address. Okay, Ed. Whatever you say. Democracy. Why should such a type of society and government be considered the best? For at least one very good and important reason. Because the people who choose to live in a democracy have decided that they want to be able to tell themselves how they want to work and live. People who have decided that a democratic society is the best one have taken a tip from nature. For the law of nature decrees that all men are born free and equal and are the best judges of how they wish to live. When men band together and form a society, it is their desire that the majority of them set the rules for all. This is democracy. And that is what makes democracy mankind's greatest gift, a legacy of freedom. The Fleur de Lis apartments out on the edge of town are the old-fashioned Ultra Deluxe. A solid building of native stone built like a fortress. The two uniformed doormen looked over my credentials carefully, then told me to go on up that I was expected. The old-style elevator with its open cage was somewhere else, so I walked up the two flights, found suite number 3A, rang the bell a couple of times, then when I got no answer... Mr. Jared. Oh, now, please. Don't batter down the door. I beg your pardon. Wow. Standing there, just off the elevator, a purse and kind of an attache case in one hand and a suitcase in the other, was one of the most beautiful girls I have ever seen. Not just pretty, but beautiful. In her mid-twenties, I'd say. Petite, dark hair, dark brown eyes, eyes with an amused kind of a twinkle in them. She wore a dark blue suit, cute little pillbox hat to match, dark blue shoes, white gloves. Mm -hmm. Is there something wrong with me? I, I, oh, I beg your pardon. Well, you said that. I, uh, I guess I did. Is there something I can do for you? I'm Mrs. Jared. And that is the door of my apartment you've been knocking on, you know? I know. I, um, I came to see Mr. Jaron. Oh? But why? Do you mind telling me who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Johnny Dollar. I represent your husband's insurance company. Oh, dear. Has Timothy been pestering you people again? Well, he called, that's all. He asked me to stop by. I might have known it. The minute I go away for a few days, the sweet old soul conjures up something to worry about. He always does. Yeah, so I understand. I've been up to Cape Ann in, in Massachusetts, trying to paint some seascapes. Oh? But I just knew he'd get himself all bothered over something or other. That's why I came back today instead of next Monday. As planned, I just got off the train. Oh, it's pretty obvious you've been traveling. Horrible traveling in this weather. I, I, I probably look a mess. Hardly. But now that I'm home, I can... <laughs> Only, why do we stand out here? If you just take this bag... Oh, yes, sir. And this little case full of paints and brushes and paper and things... Oh, I got it. <laughs> Good. Now, if I can find the keys... Ah, here we are. Oh, let me, hmm? With your hands full? <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Only, well, Mr. Dollar... Yes? Yeah? Well, before we go in... What was it this time? And you must excuse me if I gave you a kind of suspicious look when I stepped off the elevator and saw you standing here. You look nothing but charming, and you still do. You're lovely. If 
I didn't know you knew I am married, I'd probably have to slap your face for that. Oh, you would, would you? Just to keep up with the propriety. Well, then I would I would blush and I would apologize and I would try to date you for the evening. Oh, méchant. <laughs> <laughs> but really, now, what was it this time, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar? After getting my face slapped, verbally at least, and for only telling the truth? Oh, who is being the charmer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But seriously, Johnny, what is it this time? I mean, his reason for calling your company. I don't know, really. He just said he wanted to see me, it's all. All right, if you want to be so mysterious about it, I'll ask him myself. Just put those things anywhere, Johnny. Sure. Timothy? I'm home with Timothy. His afternoon nap, I suppose. I hope so. Oh, now, what's that supposed to mean? Shall we look for him? Of course. This way. Timothy? Timothy, dear. Maybe he stepped out for a minute. Oh, I... Well, yes, I guess he must have. Timothy, are you... Oh, here you are, dear. Laurel, I don't go in there. But there he is, Johnny, asleep in his bed. Oh! Asleep? Oh, no. Oh, Johnny! Just one solid blow behind the right ear with the heavy crystal ashtray that lay at his feet. There wasn't the least sign of a struggle of any kind. Nor was there any look of fright or surprise on his face. Obviously, somebody had simply sneaked up behind him, aimed carefully, and struck just once. He was a rather frail old man, and the one blow had been enough. Lorelei, after that first scream of anguish, sank into a chair, facing away from the body, and sobbed pitifully but quietly. Her face was pale and drawn, but even in this moment of shock, she was still beautiful. I called the police then, and during the wait for them, looked around for some clue as to who might have done this. Nothing. Nor was one of the doormen any help when I had him come up. No, sir. You were the first one to come here to see him today. You are sure of that? Yep. First it was you, and while you was going up the stairs, the missus come in and went by the elevator. There's the back entrance to the apartment, to the kitchen. Hey, yeah. But any delivery boy would have seen him, sir, as he come around the driveway at the side. Mm-hmm. Tell me, are there any new, any relatively new tenants in the building? Well, of course, there's that Mr. Bascom, sir. Bascom? Yes, sir. He's the newest. Yes? Come here in 1937. Oh, but uh, nobody uh, came here to see Mr. Jared today. Not until you come in, sir. And Mrs. Jared came back from a trip right after. Well, the fact remains that somebody got to him. Oh, Sergeant, you made good time. Hi, Johnny. Come on in, Doc. Well, Private Eye, what have you got yourself involved in this time? Looks to me like a murder. Sergeant Barney Foster is one of the most able homicide men I know. After Doc Bennett, the coroner, examined the body and was satisfied death was due to that blow on the head, that it must have occurred only minutes before I got there, he left. Sergeant Foster and I went over that place with the proverbial fine tooth comb, but the killer had apparently left no tracks whatsoever. The only fingerprints from the last few days were those of the dead man. And that means planning, Johnny. It was carefully planned. Have you talked with Mrs. Jarrett about any possible enemies he might have had? I tried, Barney. Look at her sitting out here. I'm afraid she's just too numb by this whole thing to make very much sense. Yeah, poor kid. You better get her out of here, Johnny, to a hotel or something. Maybe to some friend's house. Even if she wants to stay? Yep. Is that an order? Mm-hmm. Well, we've been over every inch of this place. All we found is nothing. Not very much of that. Whoever did it must have been somebody the old man knew, let in here himself. Even the looks of his face, the relaxed position of the body, no signs of a struggle all bear that out, right? Can't argue with you, Barney. So, as soon as I leave, I'm going to start a rundown on everybody that she and her husband have known or ever been seen with over the last five years. I have a lad down at headquarters who's really great at that sort of stuff. Good idea. Because the fact that apparently nobody could have come up here without being seen, but... Well, now, look. Yeah? You know, you could be the one suspect in this case, Johnny. Sure. Well, I'm not kidding. You're the only one known to have come up here before Mrs. Jared got back from her trip. Of course. And the motive? Put the old man out of the way to leave a free path to his beautiful wife. You think that isn't a common enough motive? It may have been somebody's, Johnny. Well, now that I've seen and talked with her, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, yet? Yeah. Well? Oh, nothing, Bonnie. Building up another one of your wacky hunches, Johnny? I don't know. Well, anyhow, you get her out of here. Let her stay in a hotel or something so that nothing will be disturbed until I can come back for another look. Make sure we haven't slipped up somewhere. 
She can take along her luggage, can't she? Just exactly what you yourself saw with her when she stepped off that elevator. Okay? Okay. Nothing else is to be disturbed. I'll seal off the back service door and leave orders downstairs that nobody is to be admitted to the place. Okay? Okay. Okay. Except me. All right, Johnny. What is it? This hunch of yours. Barney, I kid you not. I don't know. But there is something cooking in that so-called brain of yours, isn't there? I told you, Barney. Okay, okay. But when it gels, if it gels, instead of taking things into your own hands, you call me. Sure. Promise. Promise? Democracy. What does it mean? The word itself is of Greek origin. Demos meaning the people and kratos meaning authority. Thus, in a democracy, the people have the authority to rule themselves. But where does the authority come from? The authority comes from the people themselves. They put it in their constitution, and the constitution can't be changed by anyone except the people. That puts the supreme power of the government of a democratic country right in the hands of the people, and the people elect their representatives to run the government. In that manner, democracy gives everyone equal representation in the government. Democracy provides mankind with its greatest legacy of freedom. I took Lorelei Jarrett over to the Statler and got her a comfortable suite of rooms. Then I called up my best girlfriend, Betty Lewis, and told her what it was all about, and Betty agreed to move in with Lorelei for a few days to make sure she wouldn't go off the deep end. Also, I hoped that Lorelei might say something, perhaps name somebody that would give me a clue to work on. And Betty, of course, promised to keep her ears open. The silly feeling I had that a hunch was coming, a hunch that I couldn't pin down, bugged me for the next two days. During that time, there was no word from Betty and nothing but silence from Sergeant Barney Foster. Half a dozen times, I was on the verge of going back to that apartment for another look. But why? To look for what? Then on the afternoon of the third day, I decided the only way to make the hunch materialize was to go back there, but not alone. Well, now, I don't know, sir. The policeman said it was all right for you to go up there, but... I'll uh... be completely responsible. Very well, sir. Here's the key you'll need. Thank you. Shall we? You've been terribly, terribly kind to me, Johnny. Don't you think you've deserved it, Lorelai? And Betty. Such a wonderful girl. She's been a wonderful comfort. Mm, I thought you two would get along. If you and, and Betty ever get married, I can only hope you'll be as happy... as happy as Timothy and I were before the... You sure you don't mind this coming back here this way? No. Anything I can possibly do to help, Johnny. You know that. I wish to heaven I knew what kind of help I need. Well, maybe if we just talk about most anything... Uh, you up at Cape Ann, you said, hmm? Yes, sir. Sketching. Oh, it's a mighty beautiful country up there, isn't it? I'd never seen it before. Only heard about it. It is beautiful. I hope I can go back again sometime and sketch and paint some more. If only Timothy had gone along with me. Yeah, this this whole thing might not have happened. Yeah, but, but he knew the salt air wouldn't agree with him. So... Do you suppose, Johnny, that... It would be all right if I took some of my clothes and things as long as I'm here. I'm afraid you'd better not, Lorelei. The sergeant wants to come back here, you know. Oh, yes, I... I vaguely remember him saying that. I, I'm afraid I wasn't aware of much that, that day. No, I don't blame you. Lorelei. What, Johnny? It's kind of a strange name for a nice, gentle person like you. Is it? Why? Weren't the legendary Lorelei the... The sirens who enticed men to their destruction? Good heavens, Johnny. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell me, did you make any sketches up there, Cape Ann? Well, yes. Lots of them. <laughs> Would you like to see some of them? Very much. I know that place pretty well. Well, here they are. Right here in, in this portfolio. Oh, you leave your masterpieces lying around here in the front hall? Oh, I wish they were masterpieces. Here, now, 
You recognize this? Oh, sure, sure. That's the big bay on the west side of the Cape. Uh Uh-huh. And surely you've seen this, the the bunny cottage? Oh, yes. The two windows in front that look like eyes and the white (laughs) chimneys that look like ears sticking up. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's wonderfully quaint, isn't it? And it does look like a bunny, a big white bunny. (laughs) And you were never up there before? No, never. But I'll go again. Oh, no, Lorelei, I'm afraid not. What? Lorelei. Lorelei, destroyer of men. It's a fact, isn't it? What, Johnny, what makes you say a thing like that? You were the one person to benefit by your husband's death. Johnny. And the one person who could get in here with your own key in that back door without being seen by one of those doormen came in by the back way and killed him. Johnny, please, you, you don't know what you're saying. How you found out I was coming to make such a nice alibi for you, I don't know. Maybe you overheard him on the phone just before you killed him. No, no, please listen to me. Don't, don't talk this way. Then you left by the back door again. You waited when you saw me arrive, came in after me, this time by the front door. Johnny, Johnny, no, I told you. You know it. I'd just come back from Cape Ann. You know that. You helped me with my luggage. I helped you with a suitcase and an attache case. But you were not carrying this portfolio full of the sketches you made at Cape Ann. In other words, you had to have been in here before... Well? No, no, I tell you... All right. Listen. Listen to me carefully, Johnny. Yes. Yes, I did kill him. I killed him. Because he was an egotistical, self-centered, crazy old man. Because of the money. Millions, Johnny. Millions of dollars. To play with. To have fun with. Enjoy life. Listen, Johnny, you and I, with all that wonderful money, just the two of us, Johnny. Nice try, Lorelei. But not this time. Oh, why do they do it? Why don't they learn? Don't they know it won't work? That sooner or later they're bound to be found out. And why a lovely little thing like Lorelei? Lorelei, destroyer of men. Expense account total? Oh, who wants it? Who wants anything out of a case like this? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Rita Lloyd as Lorelei, Sam Gray as Sergeant Barney Foster, Herb Duncan as Ed Williams, Arthur Cole as Timothy Jarrett, and Guy Rep as the Dorman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.